Hey guys, it's Alan Yor. I just finished watching Pokemon the Movie 2000, which is the second canonical film. And uh, right off the bat, I'll say I liked it much more than the first film. Now, I liked the first film, but I gave it a very low score, a 4 out of 10, because it just didn't make any sense to me. It was very illogical, super childish and predictable. But still, it was nostalgic and uh, easy to enjoy. Um, and this one, this one takes a step in the right direction. Uh, I just felt that everything made more sense. Uh, Ash actually has reason to be where he is. He's not just like experiencing his natural main character syndrome, always being at the right place at the right time, everything working out for him. Um, so in general, just made more sense to me. I thought it was better written, etc. So uh, the plot of this one is this time Ash and Misty are going to the Orange Islands. Um, I actually don't know the original reason why they're going, but I made sure to confirm that they had a good reason to go because that was one of my criticisms in the last movie was that Ash has no business being where he is. Um, but this time he has reason to go there. Uh, well, I guess, yeah, he had reason to go in the last one too, but I think you know what I mean. Um, so this one, it's an, uh, adapt, an adaptation of a series, a specific series though, um, which is The Adventures of Orange Islands. So it's kind of a continuation of that series, which I have not seen, probably won't see it, or maybe I will because I like this movie, but yeah, so basically there is reason he's going there. Um, and he meets this uh, group of people who have, um, uh, they have pretty rich culture actually, and um, they considered Ash to be the chosen one. So then we jump to the villain who is this collector guy named Lawrence, and he is trying to collect a bunch of legendary Pokemon. Specifically, he set his eyes on the three legendary Pokemon, which are Moltres, um, Articuno, and uh, Zapdos, and he wants to get all three of these in order to... Okay, here's the one part of the plot that's weak. This wasn't really explained or made a ton of sense. Um, we don't really know why, but for some reason, if you get the three birds together, it will summon the uh, real legendary beast he's after, which is called Lugia, who is like the beast of the sea. I guess if I had to try and put two and two together, it's because he knew it would cause a problem in the natural order of nature, and it would like kind of summon Lugia because of those problems, but, you know, wasn't really explained very well. So, yeah, but, um, and Lugia is just trying to maintain the natural order because once uh, the collector guy captures the first bird, Moltres, the uh, world's climate starts to shift, and while it is a kid's movie so they don't go into this, but if you're an adult you know what happens when climates change so rapidly, it means crops are dying and people are starving and, you know, there's probably hundreds of thousands or millions of people dying because of this, what's happening, but obviously it's a children's movie so they don't tell you that, but yeah. So, yeah. Um, I like this. It was, uh, like, I liked it quite a bit actually. I think the main thing for me is just the fact that, so if I consider, I have not seen the Naruto movies, but I imagine they might be a little bit pointless. They might be like non-canon filler, is my prediction. Um, but this is relevant, it's canonical, and unlike Naruto, it, uh, it takes the visual quality way, way higher, because Naruto uh, Shippuden already had really good visuals, and in the, the movies, from what I've seen, are kind of the same thing, but now it's like non-canon fiction, kind of. Uh, but this one, it is night and day. If you compare this to, like, original Indo Indigo League versus what we see here, it's just crazy. Uh, the visuals here are surprisingly amazing. This is a 1999 movie, and some of the, just the effects of the weather and everything and the battles, it, it really impressed me. It was not at all kind of, um... It was not cheap or trying to reduce the amount of illustrations per scene. It was very, very in-depth. So the visuals were just weirdly good, uh, way better than I expected. 
The legendary creatures here are badass. They're very nostalgic to me as someone who loves the Game Boy games and has captured all of these beasts. I see, actually I forget that one's name, but I, I you know, I've captured all these beasts, so that's pretty cool to see them here. They did them justice and they were all very awesome. Um, the character motivations made way more sense. Obviously the collector guy has no depth at all, but hey, at least he made sense. Unlike Mewtwo in the previous film, who did not make any sense at all because the writers were forcing him to act in odd ways that don't make sense. But the collector, he's just trying to collect legendary Pokemon and that's exactly what he's doing. So it's much more simple and makes more sense. Um, so I did not like the um, Misty subplot, the Ash's girlfriend subplot in this because it was kind of eye-rolling and stupid. They do a love triangle in here. Um, but I will say I still like Melody as a character. I found her people's culture to be rich and interesting. Um, and it's a place that I'd want to explore more in the lore, so that's that's good. And uh, I forget the name of that Pokemon, but I also really like that one ancient Pokemon that's like guarding this the shrine. I don't know what that one's name is. Maybe Drowsy. No, not Drowsy. I forget that one's name, but yeah. Um, overall, just the movie was fun, easy on the heart and brain, very easy to appreciate. Uh, had very good visuals, and the characters had reasons to be there, reasons to do and say the things that they're doing, etc. Actually, now, let's, okay, so now with the negatives. Oh, sorry, one last positive. I actually like that Brock wasn't here. I felt like Brock. Brock's a little bit like me, but he's, uh, I, maybe people think I'm just as annoying as him, fair enough, but I, I found him a little bit annoying, his whole, um, because I'm known as, like, the number one woman respecter, that was kind of, like, my gimmick slash stick on this channel, I've kind of given it up now, but, yeah, and that's kind of what Brock does as well, but, like, Brock just, like, never shuts up about it, like, <laughs> for me, I at least try to, like, space it out, space out my woman respecting, but like Brock's just constantly like, he, he takes these situations and just turns them into a, a beauty contest and it's just kind of annoying, like like if someone gets seriously injured, he'll just be like, but she's so pretty. It's like, okay, maybe can we be concerned for her life and well-being first, but so I like that Brock wasn't here. I don't think he would have added anything to the movie. I don't think his presence would have been necessary. I don't hate Brock, but I just like that he wasn't here. I like that I got a break from him. I'm ready, I'm actually ready to see him in the next film if he wants to be there, but I'm happy that he wasn't here and I got a break from him. Uh, yeah, so let's start with negatives. So, negative number one, the Misty girlfriend subplot. It's just a little eye-rolling. It's probably, like, I don't like love triangles. They're rarely done very well. Um, and this one was not done very well. It was rushed and half-assed and just not really not really effective. Um, what else? The story is still very predictable, very safe. There's nothing expectation to find whatsoever. Um, actually, I thought another, another positive. Another positive is Professor Oak and Ash's mother are actually make appearances in here, uh, which I believe neither of them did in the last film, so that was good. Another negative is, uh, honestly, I... I kind of dislike Ash. There's no, he's not a, he's not a multi-dimensional character. He's a one-note, generic hero guy who always wins. I don't like Ash. I'm not going to complain about Ash every single time, but I just want to put it on the record right now. I don't like Ash. He is just too lucky, and I don't like him at all. Um, next negative is actually Team Rocket, and this goes for the entire Team Rocket in the entire Pokemon series as well, so I'm not going to ham on this every single time, but while I remember, I want to point it out here. Team Rocket's goal in this film is to get Ash's Pikachu, which is their goal in the series as well. And I guess it's less noticeable in the series because it's kind of a playful kitty series and it's a nice little running joke to have them do the same thing every single episode. But for this feature-length movie, I'm like, okay, why are they here? They, they still want Pikachu? They, do they... Do they ever take a break or have a day off, or are they just always doing this? And it, here, <clears throat> so here's the thing. Why? Why do they want this Pikachu? I believe it was maybe half explained in one of the earlier episodes of the series, in the first series, but it was not explained very well, and I just tried to Google it, and there's still no explanation. So the most credible theory is that this Pikachu has, like, maxed out stats, despite not, never evolving into Raichu. But that's just a theory. We don't know why this Pikachu is so special. 
because all of that makes it special right now is that it doesn't want to go in a Pokeball. It stays on Ash's shoulder most of the time. Um, and it's probably more intelligent than your average Pikachu. But yeah, I just, there's no like canon or reason, real reason for it, at least explained to us. So Team Rocket spends the entire time in this film just trying to get Pikachu. It's like, dude, we have bigger problems than Pikachu. We, the world's about to end because of the climate changes and, you know, another winter age is going to come and we're not going to have summers ever again. You could just take a day off with the Pikachu stuff and let's focus on Lugia and the three legendary birds and all that. So, I'm going to give Pokemon the Movie 2000 a 6 out of 10. I was very close to a 7, um, but I'm going to go ahead and tamper my expectations just a little bit because I definitely feel there is room to continue improving. This is a right, step in the right direction, but we're still not there. Now, I don't think Pokemon is ever going to be exactly what I want it to be, which is a little bit more... Like, Naruto starts off immature and becomes mature. That's why I love it, honestly. Um, and even though the immature stuff might be worse, it's still important context for the life for his life in the future. So it's I don't mind watching it for that reason. Pokemon, I don't think, is going to go the same route, and I'm prepared for that, so I'm not going to let myself get disappointed. But I would still like to see maybe a twist or two. I want to see the writing and characters continue to be more believable and more intelligently written, etc. So I just think it can continue to get better, but this was definitely a step in the right direction, and I was happy with this experience. So thanks so much for watching this review, and I will see you next time.